Hello and welcome to the world today. We're going to discuss Italy, uh, an extremely important country on many levels, particularly in politics and culture for most of our century, produced some of the greatest thinkers of the European left, and the state this country has reached today. Since the uh, evolution that began in the 90s and the latest economic crisis. I have with me in the studio Alberto Toscano, who, apart from teaching critical theory at a university, is the editor of a very powerful collection of books known as The Italian List, published regularly by Seagull Books a very distinctive publishing house based in Calcutta and Chicago. Alberto, welcome. Thanks. Let me start by putting this to you, that of all the countries in Europe after the Second World War, the Italian left was both the largest and the most influential for a long time, and if, you, if we go on from there, produced some of the most distinctive struggles, political and class struggles, in Italy in the 60s and 70s. All that seems to have disappeared. Where do we start? What happened? Well, the landscape that you see uh, in Italy today, especially in terms of progressive politics, but also progressive culture, uh, is and has been for some time, uh, uh, largely a kind of landscape of ruins. So your description is uh, uh, very much um, pertinent. And not only is it a landscape of ruins or a landscape of failures, uh, but it is also one that's very much dominated by an affect of melancholy, nostalgia, regret, and so on. And the Italian publishing industry, which, you know, even on the left or independent publishing industry is still surprisingly um, lively, let's say, um, seems almost to specialize at the level of critical essays and the like in um, autopsies, postmortems, of which we've had a lot for the past 20 and 30 years, sociological, intellectual, strategic. So, at Present, uh, you also have, which I think is worth um, reflecting upon, um, the fortunes or the possibilities of any revival of the left blocked in some way um, or impeded by what some people see as the remnants, uh, the detritus of that tradition, especially of the collapse um, of uh, the PCI. If we're discussing the actual history and the trajectory of the PCI uh, as one of the main leaders as a political force of the resistance in Italy. I mean, what is interesting to me is Germany didn't have a resistance, and yet you had a far more uh, far-reaching purge of fascism, not complete mm -hmm. by any means, but in Italy, there was a virtual continuity maintained with the birth of a conservative party. So it's, you know, the, the question is often mm. raised by people on the far left, but the PCI should have made a revolution. We don't know whether they could or could not have, but what we do know they could have done is to have fought for political hegemony fiercely, given the prestige of the resistance. Instead, they were totally outmaneuvered. I mean, we can approach that question from a number of angles. One which is of interest is the cultural one, because, of course, there were a lot of very significant cultural figures of the post-war period, of the immediate post-war period, which the PCI at the level of a kind of cultural hegemony, though I think we should be careful to what extent it really took a Gramscian form, which I think in the end it did not, uh, uh, the Togliatian interpretation and the instrumentalization of Gramsci within the PCI was something else. But within that process, there was a very effective, in some ways, um, co-option uh, and, you know, in a sense, very soft whitewashing of a lot of figures who hadn't uh, 
been really anti-fascist. And you know, frankly, of true anti-fascists prior to 43, who were not in exile or hadn't been imprisoned or hadn't been killed uh, uh, under Mussolini, ground was relatively uh, thin. So, uh, you know, in these various processes of tasfodemismo uh, or, you know, changing one's coat or turning, you know, turncoats of various sorts, you have a lot of figures who discover themselves, of course, anti-fascists uh, at a later uh, uh, date. So after all, we have to remember that when uh, Italian university professors, all Italian university professors, were asked to pledge allegiance to fascist uh, uh, Italy, to Mussolini's government, only 12, 12 uh, refused. It was a 12, famous, 12 out, of out of the whole of the Italian university lecture body. And these are not people who were facing firing squads, or it wasn't even straightforward that they were facing losing their posts. I mean, maybe a high likelihood and so on. So there's also a way, which of course is part of the history of the resistance, that the very concrete and extremely inspiring uh, uh, heroism and also political inventiveness of, of the resistance, which comes across in a stunning way in a book recently translated by uh, Verso Pavone's uh, uh, A Civil War, which is a really uh, uh, stunning work, that that was also combined, especially at the elite intellectual and professional level, with remarkable levels of continuity. In the 1950s and 60s, uh, when the debate uh, uh, around anti-fascism takes place, and uh, Franco Foltini, one of the authors we've edited and translated for uh, Siegel, writes an essay, one of the few essays, in fact, translated into English, it was translated in the journal Screen in the early 70s, uh, called um, The Writer's Mandate and the End of Anti-Fascism. And what Foltini's trying to do is trying to precisely diagnose the situation in which an official anti-fascism um, embodied in the Constitution, which is of course written together by Christian Democrats and Communists, as well as figures of the liberal uh, and sometimes radical liberal figures from the Partito uh, d'Azione uh, uh, and so on and so forth, um, that those values of anti-fascism become official and end up in some way uh, closing off, not necessarily revolutionary horizons, uh, as you say, uh, but possibilities for different forms of antagonism that wouldn't involve the kinds of um, sharing of power, um, compromise, complicity, which in some ways, if we want to be extremely critical of the tradition of the PCI, and some people have done, especially by seeing how the recent figure of Napolitano is a figure that follows that whole historical uh, arc, uh, we can see a kind of uh, um, original sin of sorts. At the same time, that also meant that the, that the Italian Communist Party had this strange role um, of a party on paper and ideologically committed to the you know, full uh, uh, overthrow, abolition, or transformation of uh, uh, bourgeois or capitalist society, but which at the same time really identified itself with the, with the state, state and really identified itself with the constitution, so much so that in some ways mo some of the most um, honorable and some of the most coherent figures that have come out of, not necessarily straightforwardly the PCI, but in any case the Italian left and communist tradition, have the constitution uh, as their principal uh, object of uh, a political attachment today. Uh, while, and this is interesting in terms of the divisions within the Italian left, the uh, new and far uh, left in Italy, as well as that curious entity which was operaismo, Italian workerism, often um, put its energies into criticizing precisely that figure of the Communist Party as the guardian of the state, the guardian of the rule of law, the guardian of, uh, of stability. Let's just come now to culture. That the old communist tradition, you know, Gramsci's obsession with Croce, the, that whole tradition, we are descendants of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, that the Italian party, Communist Party, 
embodied that belief in high culture, and its intellectuals wrote about it endlessly. But when that culture was completely undermined and subverted by the entrance of mass culture on the American model, there was shock and horror, but no way of dealing with it. Berlusconi dealt with it by embracing it and making Italy a, a, a mimic model, a, a model of that culture. They've done it in the States. We can do better than them. And they did. And politically, the follower of that culture was the pale shadow of former leaders of the Italian party, Walter Valtroni, who stood in the big square in the Piazza del Popolo to shout to his people, yes, we can. The question of culture is a very complex one, I think, in part because one perhaps has to uh, wind the clock back a little to that post-war period that we were talking about and the period of the so-called economic uh, miracle in the period also of the first center-left governments in the early 60s, uh, where you do have, of course, a very strong uh, presence of the Communist Party within the cultural domain, mainly uh, uh, in some cases looking into the party with rather Stalinist or Stalinoid modes of controlling its own members, and then extremely tolerant of uh, high-level intellectuals who would sympathize with the Communist Party who were, were, were treated in a, in a, Respected. In a very accommodating way. Very well, accommodating. Like the negative philosophy people. Mm -hmm. Cacciari, yeah. for instance, is welcomed into the party, uh, um, becomes mayor of Venice, whereas Manifesto, who opposed the invasion of Czechoslovakia, challenge it politically, are expelled. But if we go back to that moment, there is a, there is a moment uh, in the 60s which is, of course, also the moment of the greatest international projection of Italian culture, especially the level of cinema, of course, but also to some extent literature, design, etc., where there is some sense of a distinctively uh, uh, Italian uh, uh, path to or experience of modernity and modernization. You know, in a country which is, of course, still, as one can sense in the more nostalgic moments of Pasolini or even in Antonioni's film, a country that's extremely uneven, especially, of course, if we move towards the center and the south. So on one level, there is already that experience, much as it was during, uh, in, in a similar period, and the films are remarkably similar in a way in post-war uh, Japan, this experience yes. of American culture and how does one absorb and mobilize this. What's Striking then is that, of course, by the time Berlusconi arrives on the scene, late 70s, mainly in the, in the, in the mid 80s, um, it's not as though uh, uh, you know, Italian uh, culture hadn't encountered various forms of musical and material and commodity invasions, so to speak, uh, uh, from uh, the US, but Berlusconi's rise, of course, takes place in uh, the context of the immense uh, collapse of the energies of the 60s and 70s. So, um, and uh, very significantly, it's something that percolates in a kind of uh, endemic, molecular way through um, everyday life. And, you know, generationally speaking, I know this because, you know, if you were a kid in, the, in Italy in the, in the 1980s, you know, your uh, television experience or cultural experiences were, uh, you know, not hegemonized in any kind of Gramscian or Togliatti in sense, but just permeated in a kind of ambient atmospheric way by a culture over which Berlusconi and his like had a kind of grip. Now, when you get to the 1990s, it's very interesting, having also lived in Italy at that time, that a left or indeed a far left culture with a strange amalgam of a of a deep-rooted PCI experience, and this is the odd thing about the Fondazione, because it's a point of confluence. It's a rather vibrant culture, and I remember being in, in, in high school in, in Rome in the early 90s, uh, that it was the only culture there was, I mean, aside from very marginal sort of uh, uh, fascist scenes, which now incidentally are huge amongst the youth in Italy, which is extremely uh, uh, worrying, and they've more or less copied the model of the social centers in a far-right mode. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, if you were a teenager, that was the, 
that was a cultural world that you were in. It was a world of social movements, of protests, and so on and so forth. And then I guess uh, the question is how to analyze both at the cultural and the political level, what is this uh, you know, extreme uh, uh, wastage of a kind of social and political capital, which I think the Fondazione and the scene around it did have. Well, if you look at it now, it's, the, it's an interesting comparison to be made. A whole layer of young people, not vast in numbers, but nonetheless not insignificant in the impact they had, uh, is that when the PCI finally made its peace officially with the historic compromise and declared publicly <clears throat> without any room for ambiguity, their loyalty to the Italian state, which had always been there, and asked the Christian Democrats Let's rule together because the Chilean situation means that we must defend democracy against a coup. Now, whatever else there was in Italy, there was never the danger of a military coup d'etat. I don't think the Americans had that in mind for Italy unless there was a revolution. So there was some local <laughs> There was some local <laughs> plotting. Yeah. For sure. In right. Bologna and the bombings by fascists in other places, but there was never the danger of a big uh, revolutionary upheaval uh, apart from factory occupations etc which you know. But in response to that total merger of the Christian Democrats and the PCI to defend the state, there emerged the red brigades. Now, whatever else they were, uh, and they were, in my opinion, totally wrong strategically, tactically, and in every other way, they were part of a phenomenon which developed in all the ex-fascist countries. Japan had a version, Germany had a version, and this was the Italian version. And they said in their writings, everyone is sold out, the only way is to kill. Uh, but that was in the 70s. Today, that's the comparison I was going to make, that again there's despondency, people feel all the political parties are by and large the same, it's leading to a growth of the extreme right, but it's also led to the emergence of the Five Star Movement and the Clowns and Beppo Grillo and all this business. It's very Italian for a start, it's very specific to Italy. How would you explain it? Okay, and we'll bracket the Red Brigades because that would be a very yeah, okay. long uh, tale. I think in order to understand the Five Star Movement and its ongoing, if very peculiar, success, I mean, after all, we're talking about the yes. latest polls having it at 27%, which is only 5% under the Partito Democratico, whose latest polls were 32. With so a it's, with it's a, still right. With a corollary, though, that the people who vote for it wouldn't want it to govern. This was one of the strangest, but you know, so in that sense, it's really a kind of perfect protest party in, in almost in the sense that there's a reflexivity on the part of its voters about its, uh, uh, about its role. But to take a step back, I think we have to think of both some political and so to speak kind of sociological um, roots of this. One of them, which we haven't talked about, um, is uh, the Northern League. It's also a very yeah. uh, ambiguous uh, phenomenon, but which drew uh, and continues to draw because it's had a recent and very uh, disturbing uh, uh, renaissance under this figure, uh, Salvini. Um, it drew uh, the Northern League, and I think in some sense, the uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle also draws from this, a kind of deep-seated, um, resentment vis-a-vis um, -vis the state by a whole uh, layer of uh, small uh, professional, broadly speaking, to use uh, uh, petty somewhat bourgeois. petty bourgeois uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, groups, um, who had experienced the 80s uh, and 90s as the possibility, which then in a sense turned out to be a mirage of this kind of post-Fordist efflorescence, the second Italian miracle, especially in the Northeast, but not uh, just. And who then found themselves um, both with uh, increasing levels of uh, 
uh, economic and social precarity, but also increasingly feeling themselves to be defrauded by a state which makes very large uh, uh, fiscal demands, which it, it's it true it does, uh, which uh, has extremely high levels of tax evasion, but of course generally by not so petit bourgeois, uh, and whose levels of uh, uh, services and provision are pretty uh, awful in many, in many places. Now, the, the Grillo phenomenon has been a very strange one. I think it's important also to, in terms of how we analyze the possibilities and the strategies of the left or the far left, because the Grillo phenomenon has been able to absorb huge amounts of antagonistic and oppositional social energies in ways which I think are ultimately not particularly uh, anti-systemic, which are rather rudderless, and which also have some very uh, uh, suspicious uh, dimensions. Grillo himself having made more than uh, uh, one uh, dodgy comment about uh, migration and about all sorts of different and issues and entering into uh, uh, pacts of sorts with UKIP in Europe, you know, it's, it's um, but that said, uh, a lot of genuine uh, oppositional energies, and you see this in some individual uh, uh, MPs for Grillo's party, some of which in fact have left. Uh, it's one or two senators expelled for yeah. defending the rights of immig immigrants. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's a phenomenon that many have seen, uh, commentators on the left in Italy, as having, in some sense, absorbed and therefore diverted energies, which especially uh, in the period immediately after the fall uh, of Berlusconi in this uh, sort of uh, cliché draghi uh, Monti napolitano operation, yes. uh, in that moment there was actually a, 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 an interesting um, dynamic which involved uh, mass referendum, successful referendum to reverse water privatization and the like, at the time had seen actually uh, good results for fairly anomalous center-left candidates, Pisa Pia winning in Milan, victories in Cagliari, De Magistris winning in Naples, so there was this kind of uh, moment, a sort of opening of sorts, nothing necessarily massively hopeful, which then uh, was re-channeled <laughs> into figures which I think in many ways are uh, in a sort of perverse continuity with uh, the phase of Berlusconi or Berlusconismo. Um, Grillo, who comes out of a cultural world which was kind of Berlusconi's world, n notwithstanding his opposition to it, and Renzi himself. And at present, you have a strange uh, situation because the Five Star Movement though present in uh, claims about um, legality, about corruption, and so on and so forth, and therefore making local victories on this and amassing this kind of capital, has no real uh, 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 political or strategic project necessarily to uh, oppose Terenzi. Uh, and it also, around the time of the um, Napolitano's uh, uh, second presidential anointment and the like, also has missed a lot of opportunities, which is I think why some of its members were, were quite unhappy, some of its representatives missed opportunities to uh, um, shift the uh, balance uh, of power and wrong foot uh, of the Democratic Party. And just for our views, yeah. the Democrat, Democratic Party is the continuation of the old Communist Party and Renzi, current Prime Minister of Italy, was not elected to power, but no. appointed, and models himself on Tony Blair. Yes. Now the PD, whether it's a, at, at the point of the PD we can't, successor is a bit problematic because of course it's also the successor of, in many ways, of the Christian Democrats. Because this is the Margarita true. and the Partito Democratico da Sinistra, they, there was a confluence into the, and the new foundation of this Democratic Party. And of course, uh, uh, Renzi himself was a young Christian Democrat. So we now have a country that has a prime minister who's an ex-Christian Democrat and a president who's an ex-Christian Democrat. So the uh, old joke, we will, you know, we will all die Christian Democrats, which was one of these <laughs> things that people in Italy used to say in the 60s or 70s or in 80s and in despair it turns out perhaps to be truer than, uh, uh, than expected. Um, so in, in any case, I think the, the, the Five Star Movement is a, a, 
in that sense, a deeply uh, Italian reality. I think, in a, in, in a way, it is truly neither left nor right. And, and in that sense, it's very different than Podemos's version, uh, which we can discuss at length. But nevertheless, you know, it's, 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 it's uh, idea of that as a slogan of, of radicalism. Uh, instead, I think in the, uh, uh, in the Italian case, it's neither left or right in the sense of a profound uh, ambiguity. A profound ambiguity, but that nevertheless has what I sense as being the very negative effect of uh, um, absorbing uh, and framing in this strategically kind of horizonless ways a lot of genuine uh, struggles against uh, corruptions, against the so-called political caste, uh, against uh, um, uh, the you know, depredation of public services and so on and so forth. But uh, Alberto, let's say you know, we have new, when are the next elections in Italy? Well, uh, so we have, a, we have a curious situation as you mentioned because of course we have a prime minister who is, not elected. Who is never elected, uh, who in fact got into power by unseating through a party coup, uh, Leta, who himself wasn't really elected, though he was appointed you know, by, by Napolitano after the elections on a kind of grosse coalition uh, model, which now seems to be a sort of uh, uh, European, general yes. European uh, uh, model. So technically speaking, the next elections are in 2018. Um, and in the meantime, Renzi, with this majority, which includes shards of uh, uh, Berlusconi's uh, uh, party, Alfano, now this uh, dubious figure, Dennis Verdini, who seems to be also changing his coat and going towards Renzi, is now passing what looks to be a rather abject uh, electoral law uh, in which uh, voters have very little uh, possibility um, of making decisions on the uh, electoral list that basically all of the candidates will be sort of appointed from uh, the center and we're basically seeing also the proposal which hasn't totally gone through but the proposal of basically turning the Senate into a fully appointed uh, chamber uh, by regional uh, by regional councils um, and including apparently five senators who would be directly nominated by the president, which is completely bizarre. And here we have, I think, one of the um, elements which perhaps has a certain continuity with those discussions about the historic compromise and so on, which is this fetish of stability, which of course links very much to broader European fetishes of, um, of financial or budgetary uh, stability. stability. And so the NC really represents this, this push, which is a push that sees a confluence of left and right onto a presidentialist uh, agenda. You mentioned Veltoni before, let's not forget that the you know, successors of the Communist Party and the whole Italian center left has been extremely guilty uh, since the 1990s, if not before of fetishizing uh, a US uh, political model and yeah. of having all sorts of strange delusions about Kennedy or indeed about Obama and so on and so forth, including its own name of Partito Democratico, or the Democratic Party, and really seeing the, the aim of stability as a sort of formal be-all uh, and, uh, and end-all, which of course um, I imagine is uh, very uh, attractive to European powers uh, that and be, especially because, you know, Renzi, as we saw in the whole Greek imbroglio, is a completely supine uh, uh, figure, notwithstanding his, you know, clownish gestures of uh, dissent and so on and so forth. So, Alberto, to conclude, uh, we have yet another European country in a state of transition, and we don't know how that transition is or when it is going to end. So thank you very much, and we will return to this subject in several months, I'm sure. Okay. Thank, thank you, you for being with us.